no pinch penny thrift on our battlefields. All had to be spent to keep all from being lost. Sometimes we could kill an enemy with a four cent bullet. Sometimes he lived through the attack of a $600,000 super fortress or a battery of howitzers costing $30,000 apiece. Sometimes the steel power of tanks killed him. Sometimes the muscle power of bayonets. Sometimes he raised the white flag only after he felt the full weight of our guns and had broken himself against the unyielding wall of our armor. Our men were armed with courage and everything else besides. When a pillbox or a hill or a country had to be taken, we did not measure its cost in dollars and cents. There never was and never will be a fixed price on liberty and no markets in which it can be picked up at a bargain. The American army, backed by the nation, was profligate of all but the lives of its soldiers. In a world of fanatic torturers and butchers, crazy with triumph and crazier with fear, we traded huge masses of our treasure for the safety of one private in the infantry, one Marine, one sailor. That was the American idea of a bargain. At the height of the war, we were draining our national wealth at the fantastic rate of nearly $10 million an hour, every hour, day and night. Into ships, we poured all that our factories could make as fast as they could make them. Our war ledger in which our weapons were accounted was written in red ink, but that was cheaper than the blood of our men. We didn't fight with one hand tied behind our backs. We didn't fight with one hand in our pockets. Misers cannot win a war of survival. We had the greatest industrial potential in the world, and we exerted every pressure to realize it. For every field like this, there were a hundred more in other parts of the world. We spent beyond all previous conceptions of spending. Twenty times that of the Civil War, ten times that of World War I. But none of this was purposeless squandering. These were the tools to win a war. They were costing us billions. We were prepared to use them, to use them up, to burn them up. But great and rich as we were as a nation, we were not getting greater and richer in manpower, raw materials, and time. We had to make our weapons last. Against our prodigious spending, our army was planning an equally prodigious economy, even as we threw these weapons into battle. Yes, there was another side to the story of our war spending that began on devastated battlefields like this one in the Philippines. under charred palm trees in the Pacific. On a scarred beach in France. This is the story of a colossal frugality that started at the wrong end of the production line, that started with the finish, with wrecks, with weapons that could no longer fight, with blasted metal, shattered parts, with the horror and ruin of all that was once proud and strong, with the has-beens of war, with junk. This is the story of the gigantic countersteps taken against the most hideous nightmare of waste and destruction the world has ever endured. This is the story of army salvage and reclamation. Salvage is a word that every GI saw wherever he fought, a word he was constantly reminded not to forget. The instant the battle moved on, all the shattered, shot up, lost, or abandoned materiel was gathered by special salvage collecting crews. Crippled equipment that could be reclaimed and made to fight another battle. Parts still intact that could be fitted to other parts to make other crippled items whole again. Shell-torn steel that could be routed back to civilian plants, hungry for raw material. This was the first step in the process of turning America's wartime liabilities into assets.
now badly damaged, was left behind to rot and rust. The army collected everything, its own and what once belonged to the enemy, and brought them to assembly points. In these enormous army junkyards, the whole mass of wreckage, from tanks to tents, was sorted out. There were many places like this. Here, Nazi prisoners of war were used as laborers. Under combat conditions, the clothes the soldier wore on his back, the shoes that carried him through mud and rubble, the helmets, underwear, blankets, field jackets, tentage, all shared the same hard punishment with him. They came back in all stages of destruction, by the millions, faster than they could be replaced. Could they be reclaimed? More important, did it pay to reclaim them? Could the army be tailor, seamstress, cobbler, tinsmith, blacksmith, and a host of other trades while running a war? The army could, and the army did, at approximately one-tenth the expenditure in man-hours that would have been required to manufacture the same articles new. This is a quartermaster salvage shop in Reims, France. An average of 50,000 pounds of salvage came pouring in each day. Administration was under experienced officers and enlisted men. Operating personnel was representative of the scrambled state of humanity in Europe, French women, Italians, Lithuanians, Russians, Poles, and Czechs liberated from Nazi labor camps. But cultural and linguistic differences were no barriers to putting buttons on GI jackets, patching GI pants, reinforcing paratroop jumpsuits. The Quartermaster Corps, which had 23 salvage depots before Pearl Harbor, increased them to 450 at the peak of the war, spread them all over the world, Many of them will continue in operation long after the war, until the salvage job is done. Recent figures on reclamation, still not complete, total the number of clothing and textile items reclaimed and reissued at 275 million separate items. But these figures tell nothing of the time saved, the fabric saved, the man hours saved, the money saved, the money saved from being spent. But what of the articles beyond reclamation? The clothing completely unsalvageable, the rags. An axiom in army salvage is that what cannot be reclaimed in one form is converted into another. Frequently, this calls for considerable Yankee ingenuity. Here, unsalvageable GI clothing was shredded into floss for re-spinning in French mills, and the new cloth earmarked for UNRWA. The army salvaged planes as it salvaged everything else. In the furious competition of war, planes grew obsolete from day to day, almost from flight to flight. Planes grew tired from many missions, even more quickly than the men who flew them. These war wearies could not be trusted to protect our flyers against the newer planes the enemy kept throwing up. Ours had to be newer still. But though they were outmoded for combat, they were still airworthy, still too good to be grounded. Their final in full battle dress was to the Air Force boneyards scattered throughout Europe and the Pacific. These were the lucky ones. Some never came back. They were dismantled. All the fight was taken out of them. All the heavy gear included as a necessary adjunct to air warfare. Here again, Army's salvage maxim of converting to another use all equipment that could no longer serve its original purpose was carried out. With fighting planes, 
This meant converting them to non-combat uses. Since no gunners or bombardiers would be needed, metal noses were installed to take the place of the plexiglass blisters. In turn, the plexiglass would be used for replacements in other planes. After steam blasting, spray painting, the war wearies were reclaimed for non-combat missions. Some planes never returned. And force technicians tore them down, cannibalized all serviceable parts, tail assemblies, auxiliary gas tanks, oil radiators, P-38 tails, oxygen tanks, plexiglass canopies, the complex of instruments in the flight panels, and all the component parts, however small, provided only that they could be reclaimed for use. aluminum plates could not be used again on another plane. They were too valuable to be used as scrap. An ingenious means was contrived to convert them to a use nearer the earth as GI mess plates. Conversion of salvage sometimes took strange but always useful forms, exhibiting the mechanical versatility of the American mind as of this day in our history. A mobile miniature machine shop built of salvaged parts, mounted on a salvaged chassis. An airfield made of all work. A washing machine made of old gasoline drums, some gears and a motor. An ingenious time-saving device for braiding field telephone wires. A water distilling outfit whose parts came from the junk heap. A wrench for getting into formerly inaccessible corners. A clever and safe tire rim remover put together from material classified as scrap. An economical Air Force tire trailer. Gadgets. But the engineers built a bridge across the Volturno made of telephone poles, wrecked building beams and planking. Two million vehicles crossed over this pile of scrap. The Army salvaged and reclaimed chains, cranes, trains, tents, typewriters, tanks, shoes, shovels, axes, medical instruments, musical instruments, oil drums, leather laces, bridges, lamps, fire extinguishers, airfield landing mats. All this the nation produced to win a war. All this the army spent and won the war. But while the war was being fought, the army salvaged and reclaimed and saved. Engineers, 260,000 pieces of equipment salvaged and reclaimed at a saving of approximately $347 million. Quartermaster, a billion and a half dollars so far in the United States alone. Ordnance, $2 billion so far. Our war ledgers are still written in red. But some part of each page is being changed to black. That is the essence of salvage. Out of the millions of feet of battle film shot by Signal Corps combat photographers in all theaters of operation, this film itself was collected, cut, reassembled, built anew as a functioning vehicle, reclaimed to carry this very story of Army salvage.